34 part two and the last part. I was really hoping my next, my next one that I'm gonna share on is Psalm 118. And uh, I'm so excited about it, I thought I would brush right through Psalm 84. But the Spirit of God was speaking. You know, he's trying to, you know, th this isn't about teaching classes, this is about God being able to say what he wants to say. And he was speaking, and I hope you were listening because he really loves you. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 84, and we're going to look at, uh, we got all the way down to verse 7. So we're going to look at verse 8 and 9. We're going to look at these together. <clears throat> o Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. <clears throat> Uh, as I said, I think these two go together. Um, uh, David had just said prior to this, uh, they go from strength to strength. He said, uh, verse 5, blesses the man whose strength is in thee. Um, and so to be his house is to draw from his strength. And that's what we had on the board, a circle representing the house and representing us being in Christ. and and uh, representing the, the uh, amiableness of this reality of being his house and therefore drawing from all of the resources that is him. <clears throat> uh, so this, and notice that this says, this is, this is his prayer, the psalmist's prayer to the God of Jacob. That's the end of verse eight. Uh, O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Um, because he knows his tendency is like Jacob, to lean to his own strength, to depend on his own resources. And that's, that's exactly who Jacob was. But the God of Jacob showed up, wrestled with him, won the battle and uh, weakened him so that he could, you know, that's the thing. Like with Jacob, God, you know, we end up fighting not the devil. That's what Jacob fought. He fought the Lord. We end up fighting with the Lord. Um, and we think that there's just something wrong with us. But in reality, uh, it is God's way of bringing us into becoming Israel. And until we've really wrestled with the Lord, not just the devil, we're never gonna know that our strength is not sufficient. Our strength will fail in our battles with the Lord, and then we see who has the strength. We want to depend. It's easier, it's, it's not like Jacob who wrestles to, to depend on his own strength. All of a sudden it's Israel, a prince with God, and he, it's easier to depend on him instead of on yourself. So uh, this involves more than gaining strength or even his strength filling us. Our source is Christ. Our source, and, and I'm saying his, his strength can fill us and that can be the source being Christ, but we don't see that so much as the source being Christ. We just see it as him giving us strength. He can either give it to us or fill us with it. And we still don't see the most important part is that God is our source. So our source is Christ and we want it, and we want, uh, it known to all. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. Like the psalmist, we must desire that God would look on Christ, his anointed, and accept us for his sake. Uh, I love this. Listen, listen to this prayer. Verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Now listen to this. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. So he's saying, basically, um, let's see, let me just read that again. It, um, our source is Christ, and we want it known to all. Like the psalmist, we must desire that God would look on Christ, his anointed one, and accept us for his sake. Don't look on me, Lord. Look on him 
and accept me in him. We do not want to be identified or seen apart from him who is our all. And what a prayer. That's exactly what this is. This is a prayer that, Lord, you know, you are my shield. Don't look at me. Look upon the face of thine anointed. <clears throat> and then um, I wrote these verses together are, are a prayer request. In verse 3, the psalmist calls God his king. You remember that? I made reference to verse 3 when he called God his king. Um, this speaks of God in general. But in verse 9, the psalmist prays for another king. It is the king of Israel that lives in Jerusalem. Now he's referring to the house or the one who is the fullness of the house. He fills every stone. He is the living part of the living stones. It is Christ, and, the, and he's the one that holds it all together. And so he is, uh, now his prayer is related to him who, who dwells in Zion, him who lives in the house. And so, uh, let's see. It is the king of Israel that lives in Jerusalem. This is the God who dwells in Zion. He calls this king a shield. In the Hebrew, this word is not king, but it is Messiah. It means anointed. This king, this king, this, uh, this one, drawing, again, the circle representing the fullness of, of the house, uh, and all of us in union with that, and drawing from the one that we're all one with, but this is the house when it comes to the corporate view. And um, he, he's seeing, I don't want God to see me. I want him to see Jesus. I don't want to be identified in my earth life. I want to be identified in this house. How amiable is this? How wonderful is this? And so, but he's saying now, this, this king, this king, this Messiah, this anointed one, this one is my shield. This one is where I find my covering. And another word for shield is covering. This is where I'm covered. And you're uncovered when you're standing on your own merits. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> let's go to verse 10. <clears throat> For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. <clears throat> All right, so in the Bible, a thousand rep it's, represents the full measure. Um, you hear people talking about the millennium. Well, a thousand years is a millennium. And so it's a full measure. And if you want the fullest blessing to the fullest measure, um, then, what did I put? If you want the fullest blessing, if you would turn one good day into a thousand, you must come to know our king in his house. And that's what it's saying. One day dwelling in here is better than a thousand. One day serving you in here as just a doorkeeper is better than than a thousand or whatever in the tents of wickedness. <clears throat> and so, uh, let's see, if you, would, if you want the fullest blessing, and so this is what I was saying in the last class, you can know God in general. You can be like Solomon and be outside of Zion, and you can pray and God will hear you. But if you ask for wisdom, if you ask for spiritual insight, if you ask for divine guidance like Solomon did, 
you're going to go back to the house. Because in this house, all fullness dwells. In Christ and outside of Christ, just finding God in general in this world, folks, you don't have all fullness. You don't have all blessings. You, you're, you're lucky to survive the, you know, just the daily grind. God has ordained that all that he has and all fullness that he wants to impart will be imparted to those who have become one with him. And to become one means you have left your earthly identity and you've made the risen Christ your identity. And all the resources that are him, not all the resources from him, all the resources that are him are yours there. That's why one day there is better than a thousand. It didn't say it's equal to a thousand. It says it's better than a millennium elsewhere. Where is that? Anywhere else but in the house. Anywhere else but in union. Anywhere else. Okay? It's like the city of refuge. You're safe as long as you're in there. You leave. All, all that is due to you, all that you did wrong, all of that is put back on your account. And you are looked at as an individual and must... The account must be settled between you and the avenger. But in, 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 everything's different. God set it up that way. He set up places to represent the reality of the truth, which is union with him in the house. <clears throat> All right. So, um, and then he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You know, dwelling where God is in union with him and where he is, dwelling, dwelling, not visiting, but dwelling there, even if you're serving in the lowliest uh, position is better than the tents of the wicked. And I saw it sort of a contrast thing, so I, I put uh, dwelling as identified as his house is such a permanent, <clears throat> strong reality compared to, f to flimsily constructed tents that give little protection in the storm. <laughs> you know, I mean, I remember when I went through basic training and when I was drafted into the Army and, and I went through basic training at Fort Bliss, what a name for it, in El Paso, which is in the desert sands uh, at the base of the ending mountains of the Sierra Nevada so that the wind, when it blew in, hit those mountains and then hit you with full force. And part of your training in basic training is you have to go out on what's called bivouac. And what you have to do is you have to survive for three days on your own, okay? <clears throat> and you're partnered up with somebody, and uh, they give you a pup tent that you share. And they turned us loose, and uh, there's me and this other guy. And this guy was, my, my partner was a 17-year-old kid. I was 18. He was 17. His wife was, was seven months pregnant when he got drafted. 17-year-old um, kid. And we're, and, and we're let loose. Uh, we just came from Arizona. We're let loose in the desert. Now, there are rattlesnakes and there are big, there are scorpions. There's everything else out there. We had never set up a pup tent before. <laughs> and it's getting dark. And we, so we start, and we're worn out already because you had to do a forced march into this desert, you know, with full pack gear. <clears throat> And the pup tent is just big enough for two people. And so we worked and we couldn't, we tried to get it and everything. And once we laid down, there was a sandstorm. And the sandstorm blew all night. And in the morning, we woke up, we were so tired, we just fell asleep anyway. We woke up 
and the tent was laying in our face. It was a little bitty thing anyway. It was all folded over. Sand had totally covered the thing. It had collapsed. And we had fallen asleep anyway and had to dig our way out from underneath all the sand and stuff like that. That's like the tents of the wicked. <laughs> they do not hold up under pressure. They can, those tents will not last. But this solid structure of oneness in Christ, this solid reality will hold up. It's the only thing I've ever found that really works. And I'm not talking as a preacher. As an individual who tried it in the tent, it's the only thing I've found that really honestly works. That's why I preach this stuff. All right, so um, dwelling as identified as his house is such a permanent, strong reality compared to flimsy, flimsily constructed tents that give little protection. The psalmist wants to dwell in God's house with the living God. All right, verse 11. Look at this. We only got two verses left. We should have plenty of time to finish. <laughs> Um, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And let's read verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusteth in thee. <clears throat> it starts with this. For the Lord is a sun. It doesn't say God is light, though that's true, God is light, but this says he's a son. Uh, and if he's a son, then I not only have light, but I have the source of light. If he's a son, I don't just have light, I have the source of light. Um, I have as my source the central sun from whom all light comes to this world. This is not a few streams, but the sun gives a perpetual supply. Uh, this is a quote I got from, a, from a, oh, I can't remember his name. Not your regular person that you would think I would quote. Spurgeon, evangelist. An unshining sun is a sun unsunned. <laughs> An unshining sun is a sun unsunned. <clears throat> and a God that is not continually pouring forth his fullness through us is not, a f not functioning as a sun. That last part was from me. <clears throat> but it, it's the thought that a God that is not continually pouring forth through us is not functioning as a sun. But there are no limits to oneness. The sun, is our solar the sun in our solar system has given forth light, heat, and nourishment in an unending flow from the beginning of time. Regardless of the changes that have come to earth, the sun has remained the same. And I, I wrote that because when I was in Arizona, I, we were sitting there, me and Matt, and we watched a little show about uh, on the Discovery Channel about uh, the Ice Age. And there was a, a little Ice Age during like, I forget, 1700, 1600, something like that. Uh, and they went, this is just weird. And, and they believed that it happened as a result of a volcanic explosion that happened, that the ash darkened the sun and for you know, two or three years, everything just froze, and it was just like, and it wasn't just locally, around the globe. It affected the whole globe. Uh, that's when uh, the Mayflower landed, <laughs> that hard winter. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, the Earth has really actually gone through a lot of changes, ice ages and all this kind of stuff. But the sun has been consistent the whole time. There have been things that have blocked the sun, but the sun never changed. And I was thinking, how, how excellent 
is that another thing I was thinking about I probably shouldn't divert because I actually still do have a lot of stuff here <clears throat> but Matt and I were thinking and I said Matt what if there were, what if God originally only made so much water a certain amount of water and that water is still here it's never dissipated it, it might evaporate and it turns into water vapor but it's still here and then it might fall and we might have an ice age and it turns to ice and there's ice everywhere but it's still here and then something happens and then the sun starts shining in a certain way again and then it melts and there's water everywhere and an abundance of water so much so that the polar caps melt and everything and therefore flooding and you know uh, you know but it's still the same amount what if there's a certain amount of word what if there's a certain amount of reality in God that never changes we change as to how we deal with it and stuff like that and its effects on us but I mean, you know, I know it's a dumb thought, but it seems that, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, what? I think there's some truth to that. I think there's some truth to that. And that would make perfect sense in the, the way our father operates. <clears throat> All right. Um, he said, uh, for the Lord... For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Um, no good thing will he withhold to them who walk in oneness. Because the full resources of the sun are yours. All the time. Not when you're doing good or bad. The full resources are yours. The full resources of the house of the vine are yours at all times. That never changes. Uh, I wrote, will the presence of the sun, S-O-N, shining through you attract the attention of the enemy? Yes, but the same who is a sun will also be a shield. The Lord God is a sun and shield. David knew that when darkness and clouds came to him, God was the sun to him. That even when there was darkness and clouds, God was his sun. That very sun was what shielded him from the overtaking of darkness. In the house of God, or being in Christ, we enjoy God as a sun and shield. And here's, here's what I'm saying. The, the Lord God, the Lord God is a sun and shield. He, he is a sun and shield, and I saw this in two ways, and this was the first one. And that is, by being a sun, he's a shield to the darkness. Just by being a sun makes him a shield. Now, there's another aspect I want to bring in in a second, but just by being a sun, our sun, our source of all light, we are sheltered from darkness we don't even know about that never appears. Amen? Amen? And the greater degree that we can allow him to be son, because he is the son, he is our son, the Lord is, you know, son and shield, the, to the degree that we can allow that is the degree that he will be our shield in this darkness. Did you have something you wanted to say? I might not, though. All right, still talking about the shield, but the other aspect that I was meditating on. We're told in verse 9 and 11, both of those verses, 9 and 11, that he not only is our son, but also our shield. Will the enemy shoot forth his fiery darts at you? I mean, you're... you're sh Remember we talked about uh, Moses and God said to him, get, on, get up on that rock. And in God's mind, he's going, well, this is how you answer their need for water. This is through this smiting, this smitten rock, this crucified lamb. Through this, this is how you're going to meet their needs. But in Moses' mind, the first thought is, if I get on that rock, I'm going to be a target. The Lord our God is a sun and shield. And when, you, when that sun begins to shine through you, you're going to be a target for the enemy because in this world of darkness, it's going to show up. 
through you, because that's who he's shining through. You know, you are the light of the world, but he's the sun. You know, you're the one through, through whom he's shining. Yes? Yes. Well, you're right. I will get into that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I said that he, that uh, he's a, he's our sun and shield. Will the enemy shoot forth his fiery darts at you because of the sun? Yes. But the Lord God is a shield. He quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The same God who is the pillar of fire to Israel is also the pillar of cloud. Pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. The sun is what causes new plants to grow healthy and strong, but also what can burn them up. And so he's also a shield to us. Amen? He's all of that. He's everything that we need. The Lord God is the sun and shield. In these words, we see the result of two actions. When the Lord shines in upon the heart of his people, they begin to see their failures, their sins, their lack, their guilt, their corruption. <clears throat> And then the Lord becomes a shield. When he's the sun, he shines and he shows us up. Okay, then you see how bad you are. But then he's a shield, and they're not overcome by this discovery. When they see the danger, at the same time they see the defense. When they see the disease, at the same time they see the remedy. You see the disease of your own corruption, at the same time you see the shield, which is Christ crucified, who bore all the punishment for that disease, or bore, you know, your sickness and diseases, however you want to look at that. <clears throat> so, yes. Yeah. It's kind of a no-brainer. I just wanted to make it known that the fact that he says he's a shield obviously references there is opposition. In a, in a, Absolutely. In a land or a village of people who have never known any sort of offense, or haven't had war with anybody, or never had any attack of any sort, there's not even a thought for a shield. There is no need for a shield. There is no such thing as a shield. So the fact that he is a shield is to say there is attack, there is offense, there is, there is something that will and does come against you. Amen. Amen. And there is, because, you know, uh, that description I gave you is a very real one. It's, it's more real than what you see with your eyes. A dark world with you having Christ as the sun shining to you and then through you, the enemy sees that light and he's going to hit you. There's no question about it. But that's the joy of this verse is that he's not just a sun, but he is a shield. And, there, and, and then we have the, the example given in Ephesians 6 about the enemy shooting his fiery darts at you. There's, there's you know, him coming. But... The shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts. All right, and that faith is in this oneness here. Because, you know, Paul said, I'm persuaded that nothing shall separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You know, shall nakedness or peril or... No, that doesn't... On his side, you're one. <clears throat> all right. So the fact is that the more light a soul obtains, the more it perceives... It's, dark, its own darkness, and it laments it. It weeps over it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like this. The more that God makes you ho holy, the more you look unholy. And that's not true. But we're talking about the transformation of your mind, not the transformation of, because you're already in Christ. That's already settled. But we haven't walked out the fullness of the land. We've only walked out part of it, and we have to walk it all out. And, that's, and the more you find enemies, you know, the more you're going to think, oh, God, look at all these enemies in my land, the more Joshua will be able to lead you through and take care of all the enemies that you have. Okay? <clears throat> all right, so uh, this, is, this is the work of the sun showing 
showing spots and blemishes. But with grace comes glory. The Lord will give us nothing less than glory. We, and in reality, we deserve shame. Um, so let's talk about uh, that last part of verse 11, or the middle part. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. The Lord will give grace. The Lord will give glory. <clears throat> um, God has not promised to give power and riches, but he has promised to give grace and glory. Most people on this earth are looking for power and riches. But it's interesting uh, because I said he won't give us He won't give us power or riches, but he gives us grace and glory. Well, I'll comment on that in just a second. He gives grace when you don't deserve it and glory when you allow him to live through you. Notice the order of these two things, grace and glory. Glory is not first. We're not fit for glory before grace. <clears throat> we could not possibly receive glory while we are in a fallen state. Grace must first blot out our sin and the cross must first blot out us. Okay. Um, maybe I refer to it here. I had a thought, and I guess I didn't put it down in my notes about grace and glory. Um, let's go on to the last part of that. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Yeah, here it is. Our goal is not to be rich, but to walk uprightly. But what does it say? No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. If you're poor and needy, walk uprightly. If you're weak and feeble, walk uprightly. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. What will, I wrote down, what, what will the Lord withhold? Everything unless we walk uprightly. No good thing will the Lord withhold if you walk upright. Everything is withheld. And, and there's an explanation for that. It's not, that's not based on works. It's based on oneness. What is true in oneness is not true out of oneness. It's not earned. It's just a fact. Through oneness, the branch blooms. Out of oneness, there is no, you know, no good thing will he withhold from the branch that is true in the vine if you abide in him. All the fullness of the vine will he withhold from that branch that does not abide and remain in oneness in a real way. Does that make sense? It's not a works thing. It's just a cold, hard facts of, of being grafted. All right, what does it mean to walk uprightly? It means to trust God, and I say that because the last verse says, O Lord God of hosts, blessed is the man who trusteth in thee. So what does it mean to walk uprightly? It means to trust God. It, what, in what manner should we trust God? We should trust him as our son. That's our source of all healthy growth and strength, etc., and our shield, not self-protecting ourselves. We do not randomly trust this, but in conjunction with being his house, his habitation. That, the whole psalm bears that out. These things are true in the house. These tr things are only true if we hold to oneness. You find the priority of God, it's like a key. It unlocks all these other things. You don't find the key, you're going to be looking for all these individual things, trying to make them work. And they're not going to work unless you find the key. And I'm telling you now, just because I'm telling you, don't make it right. But I'm telling you the key is oneness. That opens the door to everything. No good thing will he withhold. <clears throat> so, uh, we do not just randomly trust this, but in conjunction with being his house, his habitation. We are his body where he lives. All that is true of him is true of us. For a body to walk correctly, it must be motivated by its life within. 
Our life is Christ. The Pharisees kept commandments and did things the best they knew how, but did, they did not recognize Jesus as Messiah or inhabitor of the temple. They didn't see him as that. So someone says, you know, I've asked God to do many things, and God has denied me of many good things. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk up. I've asked God to do to, to, for many good things, and he's withheld them from me. Um, but consider this. Maybe the things that you're asking wouldn't be good things to you if he gave them to <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, they would actually be bad things. You know, it's like a little two-year-old kid playing in the living room and daddy's pistol is sitting over there loaded and he reaches to go for it and mama grabs it up real quick and says, no, what? Eh, you know, and then that kid his whole life says, my parents wouldn't give me what I wanted. You know, well, you're going to have to live with it because... <laughs> Because I'm not going to give you that, you know. And our Father loves us, and there are things that we ask that he knows better that that's not going to be any good for us. And besides, usually what we're asking is not in conjunction with him being a son and shield. It's not in conjunction with the house. It's random stuff, Christian ideas of how to pray. And it's not based on the foundation. All right. So... Uh, and then I wrote, there are, there are so many things that we do not enjoy, that we don't partake of, not because they're withheld, but because we do not take them. We're not held back by God, but by ourselves. Um, and that's just very simply, and, and I'll end with this. It's very simply, the vine says... Abide in me. Now, when he says that, he is basically, you know, he could go into a long, long, long speech. But we're supposed to understand the automatic of that. If this takes place, all of this takes place. He could say, abide in me, or um, uh, if you stay one with me, then you will get 12 fruits every year that grow and you will get you know just strength and and power and you will survive storms and you will you understand what i'm saying i mean i'm saying a bunch of stuff here that is an automatic result of abiding if you're in there you get everything that he's got now you abide by faith O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in, in union with thee, in this union. O oh, Lord, this writer saying, Oh, how blessed is that one who stays in the vine and there is no end, no good thing. There is no end to the resources of Christ. The only thing that limits that is our ability to believe, but here's the difference between us and a faith church. A faith church will say, okay, I'm gonna believe God for more patience. We would say, okay, I'm gonna believe that I'm in the vine and the patience that I need will be the result of his life flowing through me. Does that, is that clear? That's, one is a dependence on Christ and a trust in Christ. The other one is a dependence on Santa Christ. I'm sorry, Santa Claus, or however you want to put it, and trusting in him to give you something. Um, and then I, I had this thought, because we look at people and we say, why does that person, why are they so gifted from the Lord in this and that? And why does that person have this and that? And this is going to be a little weird, so I probably shouldn't close with this, but I'm going to do it. <clears throat> what? Uh, People are always, you know, you, you, you go around, you go to churches, you go to concerts, you go to places, and you see people, and you go, 
that person is so special. Look how they can sing. And then you go over here and you see this person. You say, my God, that person is so special. Uh, look at their business mentality. And they're just rich and they're just blessed because they're, they're, you know, they just know how to do that stuff. And you go, this person over here and, you know, all sorts of fields. And we see this person and that one and that one. We just go, why did God bless them like that? And the thought came to me, what if, here we go, <laughs> what if we came up with a, some sort of a gene therapy, simply that when you're born, we run them through these tests, and what we are able to discover by running them through these tests is we find every single human being's top ability at birth of what they would excel at, and, and whereas now, without, with, without having that now, say, um, uh, Carolyn is born, and she, you know, her life leads her here, and she dabbles in this, and she does that, and she goes over here, and whatever. But this gene would have said, and she never in this life ever really had a chance to test everything, this gene search would have found out that she would have been one of the top trumpet players in the world but she never picked up a trumpet ever. So she was never special and she wondered why I don't, you know, why are they so special at this or that? You understand what I'm saying? But then you test everybody and you found out everybody's really, really good at something. The problem is they never discovered what that was in their lifetime and had you found a gene therapy that discovered that and then told them go this direction and da 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 da, everyone would have been special. I mean, what, you know, what if there are unknown areas in you that just because of the direction of your life, you'll never know. And yet you would have, you know, been an incredible businessman that made you filthy rich. But how did you know? And the thing is, you didn't because life didn't lead you that way. But this genius that came up with this idea of checking, you know, and that genius is me. And see, that's my area. <laughs> <laughs> would, would have found everybody was special, that God gave everybody certain gifts and they could really excel. But he, he chose that being special and based on all that stuff really wasn't about and that every once in a while somebody actually bumps into that thing. Just, it just kind of happened that way. And they seem special, but they're no more special than anybody else but that God's first concern wasn't to develop your special skill, to make you a superhero, you know, heroes or what, you know, a lot of movies and stuff been going on like that, that thing of finding your gift and all that stuff. That that, you know, uh, and has anybody ever watched the show Heroes? If you have, raise your hand, because okay. <clears throat> Basically, it's all these people who have these supernatural abilities and powers and all this kind of stuff, but what you find out is even in discovering what their gift is and everything, they still have an old nature and many of them use it for themselves. And just having the gift is not enough. You need to be right on the inside. Amen? And that God says, I don't really care if you all find your, you know, if Randy's gene search doesn't, you know, ever come to fruition, I don't really care. I don't want you to be special in you. I want you to be special in me. I want you to find your identity in me. For blessed is the man who trusteth in thee. Bless. That's the true blessing. So I'll end with that. Weird thoughts by Jack Randy. Yes, comment?
on the Amen. Amen. Well, and in closing, Jim, you would have been an incredible brain surgeon. And uh, Mike, you'd have been an architect, world famous, known around the world. All right, Father, we ask you to bless the truth of your word. And. Uh, that you may be glorified and that our hearts may be more tenderized moment by moment, not just day by day, until Christ is all and in all. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.